Don't try to take one. Marker. I'm here to introduce you to these wonderful, wonderful people who have produced this amazing <laughs> film. And I'm going to, this is Barbara Bentry, who wrote, who directed it. Her husband, John Rangel, who did the music. <laughs> Kevin and Jennifer, and I've lived with them, uh, with this film, because I think I've seen it now four times, <laughs> and I just, Love it. I'm really going to let them tell you all about it. Um, John did the music, and I thought it was terrific. Barbara, to set up, start off, uh, apart from just thanking you all four of you for being here, and wasn't this great? Yeah. Thank you. I know that film festivals are so challenging because there's so many things playing at the same time, and you've really got to make choices, so I really appreciate you all being here today. Um, this film took about three years to make, a little interruption with COVID, which was interesting. I would say um, probably one of the biggest challenges was we just started filming and COVID hit, so it was kind of like, oh no, we can't go out there anymore and we have to do this and differently, and I think in some ways it took, like a lot of documentaries, you don't know where they're going until you get into it. And when Kevin started picking up his iPhone and telling these stories that I wasn't sure, I, I don't think we had planned really to shoot that story and, and did these wonderful things. I think it kind of gave it an intimacy that wouldn't have been there if we had just taken a crew in every single time and, and you know tried to do it that way. So this is a COVID film for sure and um, I just have been so honored to bring this story out into the world. Our company, Jindo Jazz Productions, wants to bring positive images to our planet. And Kevin and Jennifer's story is definitely that. Um, so thank you for being here. And I hope that you will spread the word about the film, but even about their studio. In fact, I want to hand it over to Jennifer and Kevin because they have some amazing events that are coming up for the next 10 days. It's Origami in the Garden Month here in New Mexico. And there's a lot of ways that you can see more of this if you're interested and tell your friends. Hey everybody, Jennifer Box here. Um, one of the first events that will be happening is gonna be coming up on Friday evening. I'm going slow to make sure I get my dates right and check with my rest of my brain. Oh, that's tomorrow, everybody. <laughs> Okay, apparently I need some sleep. So tomorrow um, on Canyon Road, our gallery, K Contemporary, is going to be having an art show. And um, it's our newest pieces that literally just got finished and dropped off to the gallery yes, uh, this morning. That was this morning as well. And then um, for a more intimate experience, we're part of the Turquoise Trail Studio Tour. Um, all of you are probably familiar with this Turquoise Trail between Cedar Crest all the way up to Santa, well, from Albuquerque all the way to Santa Fe. We're located, and you can come visit what you saw um, when it was like the large rock formations. That's, quote, our front yard. And uh, the studio tour happens this weekend as well as next weekend, 10 to 5 on both of those, um, on all of those days. So we'd love to have you as our guest. And uh, what's going to be happening during the studio tour? Kevin, could I ask you that? And maybe you could let us know a little bit? We're, we're going to have this, the studio will be open to tours. Uh, we have about five acres of a sculpture garden, some of which you saw in the film, uh, that has previously been open to the public. We did about five summers, I think, before COVID hit, and we just shut it down um, to build the Atlanta show. So we've been closed to the public, but it's really our mission to make that space available. It's a really spectacular geological place near Santa Fe. Just the, the natural beauty alone is worth the visit. Um, but we've set sculpture throughout the gardens and then our studio itself will be open as well. So you can come in and see a little bit behind the scenes, pieces that are in progress, 
some of the shop and the equipment and whatnot and ask questions and just look around and you know be inspired and see a lot, a lot more work. And there's 46 other artists, I think, along the way. So it's good luck not getting distracted to or fro and stopping at another great artist studio and seeing an artist in their natural habitat. It's the only time we're open right now. Yeah. These two weekends are the only time our studio and gallery, like our garden is open, just these two weeks, maybe next summer, but right now, just these two weeks. Um, I was gonna say something. Did you wanna say? Thank you all for, for being here. Um, it's really fun to watch your work on the screen, but just like to look up. And I, I don't think people mentioned it, but Barbara did all of the editing in, for the film, which is a lot of work. But I think also really um, exemplified her storytelling, which I think is uh, really her most amazing trait as a <laughs> filmmaker. It's just she's an amazing storyteller, and I just uh, I felt really lucky to be part of it. I also was thinking as I was watching it, I was like, wow, I am so lucky to have such great visual images to put music to. It just, it was so inspiring and just easy to just like, oh, we've got to make this really unique, you know, in terms of the score. So it was really fun to just play with that. And also, I kept remembering uh, Jennifer talking about how she likes Mary J. Blige. And I was like, yeah, but then there's all this Japanese stuff. And so I was really into like trying to sort of capture all of their sort of circling uh, musical muses that were circling the, their brain and try to put that all together. So it's really fun to kind of come and see it. It's like, wow, it's fun. So that's it. And I love, I love the, um, the humor that you've got, like the stone, paper, scissors. I thought that was wonderful. That, and you did it in all sorts of different sort of styles. And, and the, when you were talking about the caterpillar, and then I saw you had the caterpillar and the pupa and the butterfly. So how do uh, the question is, how do I think of that? Um, well, creativity uh, is a practice. And so I think all of us here are practitioners of creativity. And it's something that you just have to get up and do every day. And uh, once you're in that studio or that sacred space of creativity, um, you, you play. And, and play results in going places that you like or dealing with issues that maybe are challenging you. And so in our studio practice, I think for musicians and mathematicians and anybody has the same challenge of making something out of nothing. And in that personal private space of play, we can discover things. And it's as exciting to me to see, just so you know, like I'm excited to see the work uh, at the end of the day because it's as new to me as it is to you. Even though I've worked on it a lot and we've worked together on things, um, you know, it's it's a practice. So, does anybody else have a comment on where do you get your inspiration? <laughs> also, um, it, can, it, is your truck parked out near? Uh, can they see it on the way out? Yes. They picked up a piece of. Well, explain. We went to you, the powder coater to today. <laughs> it was a convenient. I work with a powder coater in Albuquerque, so we picked up a bunch of stuff. So on your way out, you may see a red pony on the back of a truck. I hope it's still there, <laughs> uh, and some other sundries, but. What does that got to do with it? <laughs> yeah. Just be able to see some of it. Yeah, you can see some pieces there. Yeah. And you know, it's so frustrating because there are so many great things that end up on the cutting room floor. Like just now when you mentioned rock, paper, scissors, one of my favorite clips that we were working with was an elementary school in Michigan that has a little philosophy about how the students are gonna resolve conflict everywhere. They're gonna use rock, paper, scissors to do out on the playground, in their classroom, they take it home, you know, all this stuff. So they got one of the rock, paper, scissors sculptures and put it in the courtyard of their school. And it was just the greatest unveiling and they're all clapping and it's kind of like their little mantra at the school. Unfortunately, the audio was like really funky and, and um, it was just too challenging to put it in. But those are the kinds of things that um, are missing that are hard to let go of as a director. 
So I think um, now we can open it up to um, some of the audience uh, questions. Anybody have any um, questions? So if anybody has any questions, which I have a question actually, if, um, if I can start it off. Oh, you, you cheater! You, you just run got out right uh, the mic to, to whoever has a question out there. Her, if you want to run out to her. But in the meantime, I want to ask you guys a question. So you mentioned that COVID was a, a very difficult thing, which it was for a lot of people. What was another obstacle that you guys had to face um, in this whole production? Um, I would say that generally it was pretty pretty easy because it was local. I mean, that was another thing that was so wonderful. This is the first thing. Well, I guess it's our second film that's been a completely New Mexico story. So it was set in New Mexico. All of the people that worked on it were in New Mexico. And that's a huge, huge, you know, great thing. It makes it a lot easier. And actually, in the audience, we have um, a young lady who has actually brought a piece of her origami with her oh, to wow. show you. And I wonder if you'd like to come up. I think one of the biggest obstacles in the film was that COVID like shut down their operation. So it was like we really didn't know what was going to happen. And it was kind of like we were like news guys, you know, going, oh, what are you going to do now? I was like, I don't know. So it definitely was a character in our film. Yeah, let's not over or under uh, estimate the challenges COVID brought. So and, and try to find something else bigger or greater because that thing was nuts. Hi. We've met before, right? This is uh, Corbin Hopkins. Corbin, you've been to our studio, right? Hi, Corbin. Hi. You've been there last year? I think for the studio. Cool. And you've met Robert Lang when you came to visit last I remember you folding a caterpillar all by yourself, and you figured out how to reverse engineer, was it a tulip or, a, or the bird? The bird in the hand. Bird in the hand? Yeah. Cool. Let's see what you got. Maybe this origami actually That's for me? Like, I can keep it? Wow, you signed it and everything. Awesome. Very nice. It's wow, like a salamander a kind hand. of thing. Nice. Well done, man. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Yeah, thanks for coming. I'm noticing uh, he has his origami t shirt on too. <laughs> <laughs> Very, I almost wore mine tonight as well. I did too. So, is this folded from a single uncut square of paper? Yes. Is that amazing, ladies and gentlemen? Can we get an applause for Corbin? One uncut square. I'd also like to give a uh, thank you to an organization here in New Mexico that is just phenomenal for filmmakers, and that is the New Mexico Film Foundation. Terry Futchik is the director. She's in the back here, and I have to tell you, they have been so supportive, and they help filmmakers raise money and get tax deductions for the people who make contributions, and... We truly could not have done this film without her, so thank you, Terry, and New Mexico Film Foundation. We had a question back in the corner, though. Hi. Um, so I'm I am actually an art major at UNM, and then I, I actually came here because I, I was going to get extra credit, but just seeing your film, <laughs> it just inspired me a lot because um, I decided to change my major because I was doing biology, but... I really, truly, my passion is art. So I just, I, f I think like your movie kind of inspired me to like follow my dreams. And then just, <laughs> just say, um, and I will also lo love to see your um, your uh, garden. Um, I just, do you just go to a website and then buy a ticket or how does? Yeah, for the, especially for the two weekends for the studio tour, if you can, the next two weeks we're open. That's when we're open. So that would be great. <laughs> if you can follow them. <laughs> okay. Well, Kevin and I were speaking this morning about just the idea of continuing to follow breadcrumbs, not really entirely having a plan, um, and being aware, and like, and then after events, really going back and sitting with it and hashing it out and talking about it, because sometimes you miss the signs, and it's like, oh my gosh, now that I think about it, you were there for that, and that's why that happened there, and this happened. So you're here for a reason this evening, and that's all I'm going to say. You'll yeah, have to do you. with it what you wish. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, we got uh, somebody right up here. Oh, and Terry. Um, I don't really have a, uh, a question, but I wanted to share something that is very special to me. I... Um, had the opportunity to come to the garden, and I can't, I'm so glad 
I can come again, you know, in a couple weeks because my granddaughter's so excited. Mm -hmm. I had shared with her the story of origami in the garden, and thank you, Barbara, for including us in this because it's just been remarkable. So I was so inspired. I went home, showed the trailer to my granddaughter, who's eight years old, and she immediately wanted to learn how to do it. That child, it's a family event. They do it at least once a month. They sit around the table. They don't watch TV. They do origami art. And I haven't seen her in a couple months. And I showed up at the house yesterday, and she has me a piece of origami art. Mm -hmm. So y'all have inspired that. That is, that is the film. That's you guys. So thank you so much for bringing that to my family. Yeah. You're welcome. I got a sense when I was watching the film that uh, – it just kind of had a little spirit of New Mexico in there with all the scenery and the landscape. Did you guys experience something really profound with your art and the landscape? You could just get a sense there was like a spirit with you all. It was really pretty. You did a great job. Thank you. Thanks for capturing that, Barbara. We're, we're uh, humbled, I think, on a regular basis by the life that we get to live. And uh, it's not normal but it sh certainly should be. Uh, but I think it takes a lot of uh, creative courage to follow your dream and to believe in something and to, as she said, my wife here, uh, follow breadcrumbs that maybe you don't know where quite they lead to, but with great intention in your heart. Um, I, you know, we can, we hear this stuff all the time, but to really do it is not easy. Um, we're all tempted by shortcuts and the easy button or, whatever might be more profitable or more whatever. And the reality is that, you know, sometimes it's a hard decision to, to make the one that has the integrity or that is what you want, what you really want, and to express that voice, that inner voice that you know, that, that intuition, the, uh, the gut instinct. And we all know when we've not listened to that, what the results are. And then you get to experience when and you do follow that. And the rewards on the other side of that, I think, are so much greater than we can ever imagine. So, you know, all the work that we do, and I think Barbara and John are included in this within their work, is to bring a positive story and to inspire people to follow your instincts, listen to your gut, listen to yourself, and, and do follow your passion because it goes somewhere. You know, the universe conserves novelty. Uh, it wants creative fulfillment and expression to happen as much as it wants a flower to open on a spring day. It's natural. So we resist that and sort of can take the wrong direction. I, I consider it the GPS, like the God positioning system. You can take a wrong turn every day and it will recalculate. But eventually you're going to get to your destination. It will continue to recalculate. So just make good, make good choices earlier on. And I'm, I'm young. I'm, I'm blessed and, and, and I have the gift of youth, but I also had a lot of older mentors throughout my life that told me things and I actually listened to them and thought maybe they're older than me and they actually know what they're talking about. Maybe I should listen. And I have passed a lot of difficulties and suffering that I could have encountered if I hadn't listened to them. And it's just to respect your elders, your, you know, honor your mother and your father. And like, there's these things that we've heard forever that have purpose and, and uh, we need to do that a little bit more. And I just want to know, it's not that we don't have challenges. Like we just did some epic things and I just cannot even believe like the check boxes have done, are done because of all the challenges we went through, but it's how we handle them and how we know that we're going to get through them. So I just don't want to sit there in that negativity and beat myself up and everything. I, I have to get over it, get past it, move forward. So it's not that we're not challenged, all but he, <laughs> we certainly are. <laughs> get to Atlanta during a pandemic is not a lack of challenge. <laughs> okay, you had a question though. I'm just curious, my name's Kim. I'm an acoustic artist and photographer, but um, primarily it's re with regard to the bronzing and the process that you go through to create the initial piece, then go through the bronzing, and you're doing that all in TMC studios out in Thailand, is that correct? Or do you do some of it here to practice and? There's not many bronze studios here. <laughs> uh, yeah, New Mexico, I think, has like one or two that are coming and going on a regular basis. But it's uh, it's a limited 
I, I still use a foundry. We work with one in Colorado consistently. We work with one in uh, Arizona consistently. But encountering that, the masterful family uh, at TMC in Thailand, which is, you know, they've had an uninterrupted casting practice for 3,000 years, okay? When you encounter a master, and this is in any creative field or, or whether, like, again, mathematician or filmmaker, um, when you encounter somebody that's so good that everything you've met up to that point is kind of, like, behind you, it's hard to go back, you know what I mean? Um, we do everything at my studio, at our studio in Santa Fe, is to to start and finish things. But the lion's share of work happens elsewhere. But the paper originals, uh, you know, come to me like this. Sometimes the artists fly out and we fold in the studio. Sometimes they send them to us. And then I manage that through the process of getting it to the foundry and getting the paper into a, a form that can be cast. And then it comes back and we tend to finish it at our studio. So how long does that process typically a year. take? Because it's not all the time constant. It's like we're working on multiple things. Somebody else has a question, yeah. It's an air conditioner. How long does it take to make the film? You said three years? Three years. What's that process like, Barbara? It's uh, all encompassing. It just like you live it, breathe it, eat it, sleep it. Um, I bet you I've watched it a thousand times. You know, to the so point where like great. I could say all the words. <laughs> I could say. You know, um, Didn't you transcribe it all to you had to yeah, type every word? Yeah, in the yeah. And I would like to pony up on what you said, if this is the correct term, pony up, I'm not sure, but um, about finding your bliss, it's like I came to filmmaking really late in life. I started out as a professional singer and dabbled in a little movies and television, but not making them myself, and then was an educator for a long time and didn't make my first film until I was over 50, so... Yeah, and so, I mean, I had done little teeny pieces and it just kept building and building, but, you know, this is definitely a third act experience for me, and I'd like to just encourage all of the older people in this audience that, you know, you can do this stuff till you're 80 or 90 or, you know, I hope. <laughs> so, you know, go for it. <laughs> Thank you for an excellent film. Um, Barbara, I have a question. What was the seed that was planted in your head to think about this as a film? Did you know Jennifer and Kevin before? Did you come across the art? How did the process start? Well, Jennifer and I knew each other. We both worked at National Dance Institute in Santa Fe. She was a dance instructor. I was a voice teacher. And um, we were colleagues. And then... She left, or I left, I can't remember who left first, but we, you know, kind of drifted apart a little bit, and then I just kept seeing all this news about Kevin, you know, it was like article, saw his artwork on Canyon Road and everything, and kind of just moseyed back over to him and said, hey, what's going on, and was just astounded by this studio he had built and everything, and I felt like this has to be documented, and first we talked about just doing a little bit of a promo piece and then I was like oh no oh no this is a good story you know I mean I don't know how do you I remember years ago going to dinner at y'all's house and you were like you gotta see this you gotta see this and we're like what and you sat us down and we watched Chihuly in the garden and you're like you could do this and I was kind of like well we're kind of working on it but like I don't know she's like you, there'd be a great film and I was like well I'm not a filmmaker you're not a filmmaker I don't know where that came from but you were adamant about it Some, sometimes films evolve because they they have to be told it's a story that has to be told and you just you sit there and you go a light bulb goes off and go yeah we got to do this somebody has to do it and you're looking around and no one else is jumping in so you're like okay it's us then you know that's that's what I kind of felt with us I, I, I'm also inspired by a great quote. Uh, the, f the photographer, David Douglas Duncan, I was introduced to in college in art history class. And he was, if you've seen a black and white photo of Picasso, it's probably a David Douglas Duncan photo. And a quote from David Douglas Duncan is, 
if you want to be a famous photographer, take photos of all your friends, especially the creative ones. Because if one of them gets famous, you'll be famous. And nobody knows anybody else that he photographed, but he photographed Picasso. And like, that's it. No, I'm not comparing myself to Picasso, but the reality is that if you want to, if, if you're a photographer, a filmmaker, and you want to, you know, it's like, who around you is creative? And I think that for me, you know, I was telling Jennifer on our way here that for me, being amongst the creative people and the friends we've made along this path have been really incredible. And we are really lucky and, and gifted to have some really wonderful human beings in our very close proximity. And I can say that, you know, these artists we've been collaborating with, some of the world's greatest origami masters are really, really wonderful human beings. And they're world renowned. And we hang out with them on a regular basis. And people like Barbara and John, you know, this idea that you make friends out of convenience, as my wife likes to say, and you make friends sometimes through work environments, which can be convenient too, or, 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 or you're put together because of work. But in our work, because we do what we love, we make a lot of friends with people that we really have grown long friendships with, and they're really great people. And I feel really lucky to be surrounded by some great friends that have just grown and grown over the years. And we've grown with you all and watched John and you win how many awards in New Mexico? The whole time I'm like, John Ringgau's doing the music? <laughs> like, are you serious? He's a great pianist. I mean, I came in at the end of the credits and it goes from that, you know, sweet story of Jennifer talking about us going off in the wilderness together, or whatever, in love, and then John's music, and I'm like, yeah, baby, that is some rock and roll <laughs> disco, man. It's fun. So thanks for that. You know what else is really cool about being a filmmaker, too, is that you, I think you have to be really curious because um, I, I learned things about that I never knew. You know, I didn't know anything about sculpture when I met him. And I just kept going, wow, wow, you know, like seeing how things are made and everything. And that's the cool thing about being a filmmaker is that it takes you in places that you would never, ever study at any time in your life. And, you know, and then the whole thing about karma came up, which is another whole, well, that was a surprise. And that's an area that's very interesting to me and always has been. So you just never know what's going to happen when you make a film. These are, these are final thoughts for everybody, so we're about to wrap it up pretty soon. Let me be very serious now. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Um, I would just keep saying, like we were saying, like go for it and um, check out, like be aware and conscious. And I think the idea of your friends and who you surround your, yourself with, um, you have an opportunity to choose those people at some point. And so make good decisions. Like, it's okay to say no thank you to some people and yes please to those that you want in your life. All right. I think that's a beautiful place to, to wrap on. That was amazing. So thank you guys all for celebrating the 10th anniversary of AFMX. <laughs> Um, hopefully you guys will be with us uh, for we have another showing right after this and uh, tomorrow we have a full day is this whole weekend now